guys, it looks like it's it's noon already. So should we go ahead and get started? Sure, sure. Wonderful. Well, we can hear everyone. We've got everyone unmuted for our panel. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and get started with our remarks today. So I first want to say good afternoon, everyone, and introduce myself. My name is Marina Gonzalez, President and CEO here at the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I'm thrilled to be with you this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us for this informative panel discussion about our upcoming state legislative session and our current political environment here in Texas. This panel discussion couldn't be more timely as we are just five days away from the start of the 87th Texas Legislative Session. And here at the Hispanic Chamber, one of our core focuses is to advocate for members, um, for our members on policy initiatives that affect our economy, our local business community, and of course, anyone uh, doing business in the Hispanic market. We look forward to this upcoming legislative session uh, to ensure that San Antonio's economic needs remain a priority for our decision makers and friends in Austin. And today's panel features two very dynamic individuals, our former Speaker of the Texas House, Joe Strauss, and Dr. Victoria De Francesco Soto, an MSNBC con contributor and Assistant Dean of Civic Engagement for the LBJ School of Public Affairs. So on behalf of our Hispanic Chamber to both of you, uh, thank you so much for being here today to uh, contribute and provide your, your perspective and, and point of view of what's going on. Um, we're also thrilled to have our former chairman of the board, Eddie Aldrete, to moderate today's discussion. Now, before we begin, let's take a moment to acknowledge a, a special guest. We do have an elected official, State Representative Barbara Gerben Hawkins, who's joined our call today to listen in. So thank you so much for taking the time um, to, hear, uh, to hear what we have to say today and, and some of the questions that we'll have. Um, on behalf of the Spanish Chamber, I do wanna thank our sponsors that made our event possible. First and foremost, our friends at Port San Antonio, our gold sponsor today. Thank you for coming through um, and making sure that this important discussion happens. I also like to thank our silver sponsors, both Spectrum and Via Metropolitan Transit. And lastly, our bronze sponsor and partners at CPS Energy. Now we are utilizing the Zoom webinar platform for today's event. So if you'd like to submit a question to our panel, please do so using the Q&A feature function at the bottom of your screen. And we're gonna do our best to try to incorporate those questions um, from the audience as our time permits. So to get started today, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Mr. Eddie Alvarete. As an IBC Senior Vice President, Eddie has been named one of the top 100 most influential figures in Texas politics and government and one of the most influential people in San Antonio. Just this last month, um, Eddie completed a three-year term as chairman of the board of the directors for the Washington, D.C.-based National Immigration Forum. Additionally, he's the current chairman of the Texas-Mexico Trade Coalition for the Texas Association of Business and also serves as secretary for the TAB board. In 2011, we are so grateful that Eddie was our chairman of the board here at the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and has remained a longtime supporter and friend of ours. Eddie, thank you for being here today to moderate this discussion. I will hand over the floor to you. Thank you, Marina. It's a pleasure to be here and to have this conversation. Um, we're excited to, uh, to, to get into uh, not only what's happening in Austin, but uh, what's happening in Washington and how that impacts all of us. Joining us today are two very special people. First up is our former Speaker of the Texas House, uh, the Honorable Joe Strauss. Um, Speaker Strauss served as Speaker of the Texas House from 2009 to 2019, making him the longest serving Republican Speaker of the House in Texas history. Um, he has been at the intersection of business, politics, and policy all of his life. And today he serves as the Chairman of the Texas Forever Forward Political Action Committee. Mr. Speaker, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Eddie, good to be with you. Also joining us is, is a dear friend of mine, Dr. Victoria Francesco Soto, um, who is an assistant dean for civic engagement and a lecturer at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, Dr. Francesco Soto also serves as a faculty affiliate at the Department of American, uh, Mexican American and Latino <laughs> Studies and the Center for Mexican American Studies. She's a regular contributor on, uh, for MSNBC and NBCNews.com, 
but chances are you've also seen her on many other channels. She's a regular political analyst for Telemundo, and she's also appeared on NPR, uh, HBO, PBS, Univision, and Fox. So uh, Dr. Francesco Soto, thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Eddie. So after, uh, and, and just one more housekeeping item, just another reminder uh, to submit questions in the Q&A uh, box. Um, I wanna start off, uh, it's hard to have any conversation about politics and policy um, without considering the events that unfolded yesterday in our nation's capital. And last night, um, a quote came to me that was issued by the radio broadcaster, national broadcaster, Walter Winchell in World War II. When Private Felix Longoria from Three Rivers, Texas, uh, lost his life as a member of the US uh, uh, Army uh, fighting for the United States in World War II, when his body was shipped back to Three Rivers, the local funeral home wouldn't bury him because he was a Mexican-American. And that incident uh, made national news, and it was Walter Winchell who, on his national broadcast, made this statement. For a state that looms so large on the map, Texas is looking mighty small tonight. I thought of that quote because you could transcribe or transpose uh, Texas with the United States um, after watching the events that unfolded yesterday for a country that looms so large on the global stage, uh, the United States is looking small tonight. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'll start with you on your thoughts and observations about what happened yesterday. Yeah, um, Eddie, that was a, a perfect way to inter introduce this uh, topic. And um, it reminds me of a conversation I had yesterday with a, a friend who's lived in Houston for 40 years, but was born in Venezuela. And he told me that he had been in touch with some friends back there who he said were not going to sleep last night because the country they had always looked up to um, as the great example and model um, for democracy um, may not have uh, lived up to their expectations. And um, I think yesterday, we've all had some time now to reflect and to express ourselves and to talk to friends and family and the public in some cases of about what a sad day it was, um, you know, it's, it, it was full of so many different emotions. Everyone who's been to the, to the United States Capitol knows what sacred ground that really is and, and how um, violated all Americans should have felt yesterday. Um, there was a lot of anger among the emotions um, a, a lot of soul searching, I hope, about where we are as a country in our terms of our political discourse. Um, it was a reminder of how fragile our system really is, that um, I'm probably guilty of it as well, but I think all of us have taken um, uh, the, the peaceful transfer of power for granted. Um, but it just reminds all of us again that we have to be vigilant that it's up to all of us to protect our institutions that are built and maintained on trust. And, um, and yesterday was just a very difficult day for that. Um, but the sun did come up this morning. And in San Antonio, at least, it's a bright and sunny and beautiful day. Um, I hope it is in Washington. Um, and, and I thought watching some of the senators last night, um, not all of them, but all but about six or seven um, made me hopeful again. And that, um, you know, maybe after 1447 days of Donald Trump's presidency, um, what people hoped wouldn't happen happened. Um, and that we can move forward from here, um, rededicated to rebuilding the trust and the confidence uh, that, that we should have in our institutions in the United States and to once again become the model that those freedom seeking people everywhere uh, need us to be. 
Well said, uh, Dr. Francesco Soto. Uh, you know, uh, not only your your thoughts on on what happened yesterday, but um, some of the reaction that we're hearing from across the globe. Uh, people, uh, foreign leaders, are just stunned uh, to what the speaker just mentioned. Uh, you know, people in mm -hmm. Venezuela and others uh, look to the beacon that is the United States. So, um, where does that leave us? We are that city on a hill. However, yesterday for a brief moment, it looked like we may not be that. And that was very, very scary because is, is, is someone, I know here at the chamber, many folks do a lot of international business, international business with Latin America. This is stuff that happens other places, regrettably in Latin America, um, you know, in, in Eastern Europe, in Africa. It's not supposed to happen here, but we came close, closer than we've ever come before. And that was a very tragic episode. However, I do want to echo the speaker's optimism in that I think that the silver lining to this tragic event was that it has made us realize that our democracy is not something you put on autopilot. You just don't go, okay, we had our framers write up the constitution, let's just keep going. It is something that we need to actively keep working on. Just like in any interpersonal relationship, you have to actively work at it. And I think the same goes for our democracy. Now, I, I in, in looking at what this will mean as we move forward mm -hmm. beyond January 20th, at my core, I am an optimist. And I hope that in seeing what has transpired, the speakers from both parties, uh, you know, the majority leader, the minority leader will come together and say, we're going to have our, our differences of opinion, but ultimately we need to work together to preserve the fundamentals of American democracy. So just, I want to uh, stay with you uh, on the notion that um, yesterday, um, you know, when you consider the, the, the debate that was going on uh, was about to uh, the certification of the Electoral College. And one of the comments that uh, Leader McConnell made before um, the breach of the Capitol was, um, we must not emulate nor escalate the very thing we repudiate. Um, and that was probably the strongest um, uh, distancing that we've seen between Leader McConnell and the president. So where does, what does that mean uh, nationwide uh, as, we, as we move forward in order to govern? Right, and then, and then Eddie, later that evening, right, after all of the chaos ensued and we saw our, our um, senators and representatives come back to a joint session, we heard Leader McConnell and also uh, Chuck Schumer, Senator Chuck Schumer, also come back about that same message of needing to come together and also to give voice to mm -hmm. the popular vote, to the vote of the people. And so one thing I've, I've been thinking a lot about and I've been thinking about it even before all of this ensued is what is the future of the Electoral College? Because in essence, this symbolic practice caused so much ruckus. This was this enabled President Trump to, if you will, take a last stand. Democrats have been wanting to get rid of the Electoral College for a long time. Republicans have been pushing against that. However, I think that as a result of the events that transpired yesterday, we may see the Electoral College really come onto the chopping block. You know, Republicans, especially more moderate Republicans may say, you know what? The chaos that this could potentially bring is just not worth it. We need to allow a, a, a more stable vehicle for the popular vote to be voiced. So I'm going to be watching this from a macro institutional perspective over the next couple of years as we near the, the 2024 election. Uh, Mr. Speaker, yesterday what we saw was a little bit of a split screen. Um, the predominant image that we saw was the breach of the Capitol and scrolling at the bottom was that John Ossoff had secured his election, uh, his victory over uh, Senator Perdue. And uh, I think some of that got lost in the, in the news coverage. And uh, 
the election of the two Democrats in Georgia, I think was what Democrats in Texas were hoping to see. Um, you know, when you look at the November 3rd election, there was a lot of talk about um, Democrats, they're picking up 12, maybe even 15 seats, uh, definitely the nine they needed um, to be able to secure a majority. So what happened November 3rd um, that, um, that the Democrats not only did not pick up those seats, but they really didn't gain any at all? Yeah, I think it's also, um, before I get, get to that question, another question that I've been asking myself is, how did Democrats lose 12 seats in the Texas House in 2018 when they weren't even trying? And then in 2020, um, they netted nothing. Um, but I think it's, I think that we have to wait for time to tell us whether this latest election was a Trump, a Trump thing. Um, I think the um, the turnout was was very impressive, it was in Texas and all over the country, and that is a very positive thing that people woke up and exercised their right and privilege to vote. Um, but as a as a lifelong Republican, uh, beginning back when Republicans weren't winning much at all in Texas. Um, you know, I've seen this party uh, become the dominant party, but it didn't happen in one election cycle. It happened over time. And so I think it'll be interesting to see going forward, um, you know, whether, whether Democrat um, strength um, increases and whether their success uh, improves or whether Texas remains what it is today, a solidly Republican state. Um, you know, I was, I was surprised at the election down ballot. Um, I'm involved in the Republican state um, leadership committee, which is uh, a national organization focused on down ballot legislative races. And I can tell you that there was very little optimism just a few weeks before the election. Democrats were spending money like we had not seen before. Um, and whether it was spent effectively or not is something the Democrats are going to have to take a close look at. Um, but Republicans spent money too, but it was in response and it was, and it was unexpected. Um, and so I think what, what led to the Democrats' lack of success was that Republicans were effective in making their charges stick. And specifically, I'd, I'd say the, the defund the police charge was a very damaging um, uh, charge against Democrats that they in <clears throat> Texas were, were very ineffective in uh, dealing with. And that surprised me. Um, Joe Biden was able to knock that down. And I thought he did a pretty good job of it. He was very blunt and uh, very clear about that. But Texas Democrats, for some reason, couldn't break through on that. Um, so it's gonna be interesting over time to see what happens. But this election cycle um, was surprising to a lot of Republicans and just how well um, and how well they did. You talked about the, the amount of money that was spent in some of these races. Your successor, Steve Allison, I believe had the most amount of money spent against him yet he still won and he won handily. Um, why do you think that is? Well, for one thing, I think he's, he's an example of, of a Republican who is, uh, you know, he's not a firebrand. He's, he's mature and he's experienced and he's from this community where I live. Um, people know him. And um, in his first session, he acquitted himself really well. He stuck to important issues that were important to his constituents. He was a passionate advocate for um, the education reforms and funding reforms that were made. And um, I just think he was a difficult target because he had a solid record and he's a, and he's a decent human being. <laughs> um, but he, he was able to have some resources too, not as much as were spent against him, but it's, it's basically a Republican district. It's a, it's a, uh, 
you know, solidly um, middle class with some pockets of real wealth. Um, but, um, but he's a good fit for this district. And I, I wasn't surprised that he won, but he, I was surprised at the, uh, um, at the, at the strong campaign against him. Uh, Dr. Francesco Soto, let's, let's talk about, um, what surprised a lot of people beyond the Democrats not being able to pick up any seats in the house. Uh, President Trump won Zapata County and in Star County, uh, a little bit further south uh, along the Rio Grande. Um, Biden won by five points in 2020, where Hillary had won by 60 points in 2016. Um, I think people were stunned at what happened in several areas. In the 15th Congressional District, uh, Congressman, incumbent Congressman Vicente Gonzalez won by 50.5% of the vote. Now, in Zapata County, um, people admitted to voting for Trump, but then going back and voting for Democrat on all of the other races. And some of that seems to be because of the oil and gas message and oil and gas is the largest employer there. Um, and the, the law enforcement, you've got Border Patrol, DEA, FBI, ATF, US Marshals and all those there, they're a major employer. Um, and then also the right to life issue in a predominantly Hispanic Catholic area, but that's one county. Tell me what you saw and, and what you uh, believe happened in Texas with the Hispanic vote on November 3rd. Right, so Eddie, this, you know, this is a prime example of the diversity of the Hispanic population of the Hispanic electorate, right? So yes, there are some common similarities that bring us together that make us Latino, Hispanic, Latinx. But at the end of the day, it's those details that are going to sway these specific local races or the electoral context within these <clears throat> certain counties. So I, I think there are a couple of things here and you noted some of them. I think they were policy based. You know, it, it was about the pocketbook. It was about, you know what, my livelihood depends a lot on the oil and gas industry, and I'm worried about what a Joe Biden would do to that. I'm going to vote for Trump. So there's the policy piece. There's also the, the right to life versus the, the pro-choice piece. That has always been a very strong one, and we have seen in data throughout the decades that Latinos, even though they do cleave toward the Democratic Party, are more um, pro-life than the aggregate electorate. And then finally, there is the piece, as you noted, about folks having ties to border patrol, to customs, to law enforcement agencies. And this goes back to Speaker Strauss's comment about how harmful the defund the police, the kind of the, the, the rhetoric surrounding law enforcement. So I think these were policy pieces, but also very important here and that we can't lose sight of was the logistical campaign mechanism as well. Democrats, because of public health concerns, decided to not have a ground game in Texas, or at least not an organized and well-funded one, whereas Republicans had an incredibly well-funded and well-organized campaign. And if there's something that we know, it is that direct contact, direct contact excuse me, is what seals the deal among the electorate at large, and in particular among Latino communities, among ethnic communities. It's the knocking on the door and saying, hey, can I come in and have a cafecito and tell you about my politics? That didn't happen this time around because of the pandemic. Whereas, again, Republicans, you know, President Trump had folks on the ground for months. Another thing I want to throw in there, and, and I think it is important, is that Joe Biden was not Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton had very deep roots in South Texas, right? So she, she did not end up winning the presidency in 2016, but she did extraordinary, extraordinarily well in these areas because of that relationship. Joe Biden didn't have that relationship and politics is also about relationships in addition to policy, in addition to logistics. So I think it's when you start to bring all of those pieces together, you can understand what happened in Texas. So I think that for, for Democrats, they need to take a lesson and understand you know, how to micro-target, how to more effectively engage with folks, because if not, 
these constituencies are fair play for the Republican Party. That, so, that uh, is, along, go ahead. I'm sorry, that, that point about direct contact and door-to-door and -door campaigning, I can't emphasize enough how right she is. Um, the, the Republican campaigns made that the number one priority. Mm -hmm. And, you know, text messaging and the blast phone calls we all ignore, all of that stuff, the television ads even kind of all run together. Um, the, the direct asking for the vote face to face was incredibly effective and I know made the difference in some of the swing districts that be, have recently become swing districts, uh, particularly in the, in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex made a huge difference. So Look, if I can give an example, Eddie, really quickly to this was please. in um, it, Congressman Hurd's district, right? That he, he, he will no longer be serving it. But in that race, we know that the Republican candidate knocked on like 30,000 doors, something ridiculous like that. I, I remember talking to someone who worked on the campaign. Gina Ortiz Jones knocked on zero. I mean, zero, 33,000 in a district that is so close. It is what, one of the swingiest districts in the country, I've heard it say. So this is where this can really make the difference. And it's critical for both parties to have that contact. Yeah, she, Gina Ortiz Jones lost by 780 some odd votes two years ago. So she was considered the odds on favorite to win this time around, especially against a uh, someone who was not known at all, Tony Gonzalez. And, um, but once the pandemic hit, they took two completely different approaches. Uh, Gina did everything by Zoom, by her own admission. Whereas Tony not only knocked on all those doors, but every Friday night, he was at a high school football game in one community or another in his district or in that district, um, he went face to face, he was very visible in the community. So I think that does make a difference. And Mr. Speaker, I'm reminded of, uh, you made the comments, all politics are local. The lesson that uh, Tip O'Neill learned when he was US House Speaker and he lost reelection to Congress um, and discovered when he knocked on a door and he saw a woman who had uh, his opponent sign in her yard after years of her supporting him. And he asked, why are you supporting my opponent? And she replied, you forgot to ask me for my vote. Mm -hmm. um, so it does make uh, the retail politics. I think what we've seen in the 23rd congressional district and what we see in, in other areas uh, does make a, a big difference. So um, along those same lines, what does that mean for access to the Capitol? I mean, we're talking about knocking on doors and meeting face to face, and we're still in the middle of a pandemic. We're seeing surges in certain hot spots. Um, everybody's very concerned, but by Texas Constitution, um, the members of the legislature must conduct their business in the Capitol building in a public way. Um, but how do you balance, Mr. Speaker, that? with um, the, the need to keep uh, everybody safe? That's a, it's a tall order um, and it's gonna be difficult. And I think the session will, will look vastly different from all the ones that I participated in. Definitely will be fewer people around. Um, and I think it's appropriate that the preservation board and the house and the Senate would, would require people to wear masks um, and I'm encouraged that they uh, have a testing, um, a testing regimen set up uh, there at the Capitol that's available to people. Um, and usually on the first day of the session, it's a jam-packed party where family and friends and members and staff and the public um, all flood the place. Well, it won't look like that this time. Um, and we just have to get used to that, at least for this for this cycle. Um, one one thing I'm I'm hopeful about, but I fear won't happen, is that some of the members um, will not adhere to the rules. And um, and I and I hope I'm wrong, but I think some of the members may um, defiantly refuse to wear a mask. 
Um, I already have reports since the Capitol opened a couple of days ago until yesterday um, that some of the members and some of the staff were clearly, there was no mask to be found anywhere around their office. And so, um, you know, I think it's, it's going to be interesting to see how it, how it unfolds over 140 days. Um, I think that, uh, that it would be a real shame if the public didn't have the access to the members during the session that they've always had. Clearly, it won't be as up close and personal as it's been, uh, but there have to be ways to communicate. There have to be ways to get the attention of their members while they're making decisions on really important policies and laws. Um, and I think there are ways to do it. It's just, we're just gonna have to adapt. And I also know for a fact that the members want to hear from their constituents. They don't wanna make a mistake. They don't wanna to, to come down on the wrong side of an issue that will be a problem for them politically or just the wrong thing to do for the people they represent. So um, it's going to be different, no doubt. Um, I do hope that the members are responsible and that, um, and that everybody plays carefully by the rules and engages as much as as possible, whatever by whatever means are available. Uh, Dr. Francesco Soto, you're an expert in civic engagement. How do you engage if you can't engage? Well, again, I, I am an eternal optimist, and I think that here perhaps there may be an opportunity to expand the engagement beyond that of physical engagement. So. While there is no substitute for physical engagement, we know how big our state is. We know that our state is the size of a whole bunch of Eastern Seaboard states put together. And so the ability for someone who has an issue that they want to engage with the legislature, that they want to testify, is a challenge. It's a day's worth of travel there and then another one back. So now that we are in our Zoom land, I hope that we can find a way to effectively incorporate virtual technology that will serve us for this session where we're in the middle of a pandemic, but also stay beyond the pandemic in order to make it easier. You know, get rid of those hurdles of distance for our Texans from all over the state. So I think it's understanding that and how to do it effectively, right? I'm not just saying, okay, the media and, and webinars are the answer to everything. Let's figure out how exactly do we do that? Do we have an office hours where a, a representative or a senator gets online and, and has these, these meetings? Is it where folks can sign up virtually like they would in person to testify? So I think the devil is in the details there, but I hope that this may allow for a bit more civic engagement. So we are entering the session uh, as it opens next week. Uh, with new leadership in the Texas House. Um, by all accounts, Mr. Speaker, it appears that Representative Dade Phelan has uh, the votes to become the next uh, speaker. Tell us about him and what you, what you know of his work ethic and his style. Yeah, well, um, we worked together for a couple of sessions when he first um, came to the legislature from uh, Beaumont. And um, he immediately made a made a positive impression. And uh, it wasn't much of a surprise to me to see him rise as quickly as he has. He has a very strong work ethic. He's a good and decent person. Um, he, uh, he's, he's not naive about the legislative process. He's been a staff member before he was a member. He was an appointee of, of a governor to, a, to an important um, um, district, uh, I think it was a water district or a river authority. Um, so he knows he knows his business, and he's been um, effective, I think, in um, in in reaching out to members of the house uh, even before this uh, latest unexpected turn and opening um, at the speakership. Um, I think he's going to be a good speaker for the members, which is really the most important thing that that person has to, has to be. I think he'll stand up for the house as an institution. And um, I think he'll respect the diverse um, priorities and the diverse perspectives 
that the 150 members present to him. And uh, so I have very high hopes for him and I think he's going to do a, a good job. Um, it's certainly an interesting scenario that he's taking over in um, logistically and it'll be a real test for him. But I think he'll do really well and I think the members will um, will give him a nice long honeymoon period and let him prove himself. But I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about it. So the, the w one of the key challenges that he's going to face uh, from a leadership standpoint is the uh, estimated budget shortfall of $4.6 billion, according to the state controller. Um, mm -hmm. He's most recently said it's actually going to be a little bit better than that. Um, and But they're going to have to balance the budget. They're going to have to uh, find revenue uh, sources. I assume that some combination of some spending cuts and perhaps dipping into the rainy day fund. How do you see that uh, uh, being tackled? Well, I think it's going to be a really challenging budget session, no doubt. Uh, and that four or so billion dollar shortfall is in the budget cycle we're in today. Um, so while that may be manageable, it doesn't address whatever unknown budget uh, pressures they're going to have in writing the next two year budget. Next Monday, that will become a lot more clear when um, the comptroller releases his revenue estimate, which is the maximum amount of money that the budget writers will have to spend. Um, and not knowing what that number is going to be, it's pure speculation, but I think it's gonna be a really tall order to be able to maintain, um, maintain the level of spending that, uh, that was committed to last session just on House Bill 3 alone, which was the marquee accomplishment. That was about an $11 billion bill split, you know, between increases in funding and education and uh, buying down property tax rates. Those, those, those become more expensive over time, um, not less expensive. And I think it's gonna be a really important uh, priority, I hope it's an important priority for the legislature to maintain the good work that they that they did in 19. Uh, but it's going to be difficult, not to mention the effect on our economy um, of COVID-19, the loss of hundreds of thousands of jobs, um, the health care coverage that went with many of those jobs. Um, and uh, it's going to be it's, it's going to be a really interesting uh, challenge. I was speaker during both good times and bad times. And in 20, 2009 and 2011, we had our challenges, 2011 in particular. Um, and uh, I don't see the legislature looking for revenue increases in terms of increasing taxes. Um, I think they're gonna do everything they can to avoid that, um, which makes, um, which makes whatever cutting they need to do, um, even that more delicate of, a, of an exercise and a difficult one. So one of the other issues beyond the budget that the legislature is required to deal with is redistricting. Um, that can't begin until the federal government hands over the final census numbers to the legislature. Um, Dr. Francesco Soto, we've seen an explosion of growth in the Texas Hispanic community um, by the most recent estimates of 2 million people. Um, what does that mean for redistricting and what does it mean for um, the, uh, the change of the demographic and political makeup of the state? Right. So let me start off by saying that Demography is not destiny. Many people uh, assume it is, but it is not. It is not just the fact that Texas is going to turn blue because there are a whole heck of a lot more Hispanics than there were a decade ago. It's a whole lot more complicated than that. And I think kind of to parse it out, first let's start with the fact that the Republicans maintained control of the House. They We, we knew that you know, the Senate wasn't really a, a question, but the House was. There was, you know, discussion of perhaps the D's would take over. That did not happen. So Republicans, as they were in 2010, 
will again be in control or have more say in terms of drawing those lines. So the other piece that is important is though, even though we have seen dramatic growth in the Hispanic population across the country and in particular here in Texas, I think there are two things that are going to damp down that effect. The first is I, I've been very worried about an undercount as a result of A, the pandemic, and B, the rhetoric um, coming out of the White House regarding um, citizenship, mixed status families. So I think that there were a whole bunch of families who decided to just not answer it out of fear of, you know, if the federal government would, would come, if they would send ICE. So I think there's going to be an undercount. And the second issue here is that a lot of the growth is in areas that already have a whole lot of Latinos. So it's your, your San Antonio's, your Houston, your Valley's. So it's not necessarily that we're seeing a diversification of the Latino electorate across the 250, is it 53 or 56 counties that we have? 54. 50, all right, we'll split the difference. 54 <laughs> counties. So, uh, you know, it's, so we're not going to see anything radical changing in terms of districting lines. Because um, you know the Democrats did gain seats in, in the prior election in 2018, um, they will be able to exert a little bit more pressure. So I'm expecting a couple of tweaks at the margin that may help Latinos um, in terms of having a, a greater representational voice, maybe marginally help Democrats. But at the end of the day, Republicans are still in the driver's seat when it comes to drawing the lines. Mm -hmm. And Latinos, um, I think, have been uh, underrepresented in their growth because of the uh, factors I just mentioned. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, on the other side of the uh, Granite Dome building in the Senate, uh, we did see one minor change, and that was a Democrat state representative, Roland Gutierrez, uh, defeating Republican uh, Senator Pete Flores. Um, that changes the dynamic in the Senate a little bit from the standpoint that traditionally um, you needed 21 of the 31 senators uh, to get issues moving on the Senate floor. The Senate changed the rules to 19 when they lost a couple of members. And now there's word that the Senate may be considering changing the rules again. What is what does that mean to, uh, if they do change the rules, what does that mean to legislation uh, that might move from the House to the Senate? Um, well, I, I, I habitually try to refrain from commenting on the Senate, but, um, but I'm trying to get over that, that habit. Um, I, I don't know. I, I personally think it's been um, an unfortunate change um, you know, it's, it, going back to both Republican and Democrat lieutenant governors, from Bill Hobby to to Bob Bullock and Bill Ratliff and Rick Perry, they were able to preside over the Senate with the 21 vote rule and find consensus and operate uh, that chamber effectively. They've changed it to 19, may change it to 18. I don't really know what advantage that gives the Senate. In fact, I don't want to give anything away here, but I think it gives an advantage to the House in many ways. And, uh, you know, if you can just pass a lot of bills out of the Senate, that's what the House does. Um, it ought to be tough. It ought to be difficult to pass a bill. And I think it gives up some leverage on the Senate side. So if they do it, I think they'll just be giving the House an advantage. Um, but I think this lieutenant governor, um, you know, he's unorthodox in many, many ways, and this is just one of them. Eddie, yeah. if I could piggyback on, on what Please. the speaker said, because I think this really ties in to the events of the last 24 hours. We, we started off this session by talking about how our democracy is something that requires active work. It's not something you put on autopilot. And enforcing ourselves to consensus in the lieutenant governor, in the Senate chamber, forcing itself to come to consensus. That helps fortify our democracy. It may not play well with our partisan politics, but it is good for the whole. So I think in, in zooming out and looking at this potential rule change, we should look at it in the context of 
what it means for just civic health, for civic engagement health, for civic discourse. And I, I, I would hope, I would plea that these, mm -hmm. these more rigid guidelines are put into place to force us to consider our better angels. So, um, you know, when you, when you look at the uh, top priority issues that often come up during a legislative session, um, broadband and the Texas Workforce Commission traditionally don't rise to the top 10. Uh, but the one thing that the pandemic has taught us when every child has to now learn um, in a virtual environment and attend school in that way with limited broadband in uh, certain neighborhoods or certain parts of the state or the lack of high-speed internet in rural parts of the state. Um, and then also when so many people were attempting to apply for unemployment, the Workforce Commission uh, websites tended to crash quite often. So considering those two issues uh, what else do you foresee perhaps coming up in the session that are, are going to be faced or tackled in order to help us continue to work through the pandemic? Mr. Speaker, I'll start with you. Okay. Um, well, I think uh, those two issues you outlined are rising to the top. Um, the, the lack of broadband um, access and availability um, was one that has been out there for a while and gotten a little bit of attention, particularly in the herb, in the, in the uh, rural areas of the state. And it's only through um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic that we've realized or that I've realized what a problem it is in urban areas. Um, and there are different challenges, the urban and the rural broadband access issues, but they both will require attention, they're going to require uh, funding. And, um, and I think that that's, um, you know, a, a, a very worthy goal. And I hope that I hope an advancement can be made. Um, that may be an area where if there's a if there is a federal infrastructure bill, uh, that that's that would be an area where bipartisan consensus could be built, I think. Um, and workforce Workforce development, never more important than it is now as we try to figure out how to help small businesses get back on their feet, as we try to help people who've been placed out of the workforce back into, back into jobs that they have the skills to access. Um, those two issues you raise are incredibly important. Um, probably a, a, from a little higher level um, and not really in the policy area, the, the COVID-19, uh, we got to get our arms around it finally, or get our arms in it and get people vaccinated. <laughs> and uh, until that happens, our, our economic recovery really isn't, isn't um, can't happen. And um, I think from the very beginning of this pandemic, the, the lack of cooperation and productive working relationships between the state of Texas and our local leaders has been very concerning to me. And um, I'm hoping that, uh, that, the, that the vaccine gets rolled out well, better than it has the first few weeks, and, um, and the Texans take advantage of opportunities to uh, protect themselves and to get our economy back going. Um, we talked about the budget and how tight that's gonna be. And um, I think that uh, getting the pandemic under control, people vaccinated, anything the legislature can do, um, that's going to solve a lot of these other other issues. And then, and then always, even before COVID-19, um, public education and strengthening our community schools, I think is the number one job um, and responsibility of the legislature. It's even more important now. And I mentioned earlier, the great work of House Bill 3 in the last session has got to be preserved. And um, that's not going to be easy to do, but it can be done if it's prioritized. And um, I have some confidence that both on the House side and on the Senate side, that it will be prioritized. Um, but that's absolutely essential. And then an, an area that's been um, kind of a, a passion for me and an area the legislature has done a really good job on, 
the last four years is better funding our mental health care system. Um, and I think that the pandemic is just shining a brighter light on the effects of mental health. And, uh, um, you know, we're bound, we're bound to see more with all the isolation that we've had, the economic anxiety that we've gone through. We're bound to see more cases of depression and uh, mental health problems. So I hope that the legislature will also um, continue its focus in that area. I know that House Bill 3 has been an important focus of the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber, so um, we'll continue to, to watch that. Dr. Francesco Soto, any, any other thoughts on issues that might come up or uh, how we move forward through the pandemic? So very briefly, I'm, I'm hopeful that we won't see a couple of issues come up, and namely these, these more social issues um, or racial issues. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that the legislature will stick to the items that Speaker Strauss just laid out instead of going down the rabbit hole of another bathroom bill or going down the rabbit hole of immigration or you know trying to take away in-state tuition. So let's focus on what is important and not on issues that distract and that divide. Well, it, it seems the early signs, what we're hearing from the leadership in the House and the Senate is they don't have time and due to the pandemic, you know, they have to stay extremely focused. So um, it, it does sound like they may be focusing on the basics of budget redistricting and uh, education and a few other issues. So um, thank you both. Can, uh, can, I, just, can, I, can I just Go say ahead. one last thing? Please. Yes, I think you're right. And the leadership is saying that, but in this era of uh, restricted access, I would encourage your members of the chamber to be ever vigilant because some of those rabbit hole issues can present themselves very quickly mm -hmm. and can uh, advance very quickly, especially in an environment where fewer people are watching. Words well spoken. Uh, Speaker Joe Strauss, Dr. Francesco Soto, thank you both for joining us. And at this time, I'd like to turn it back to the Hispanic Chamber CEO, Marina Gonzalez. Well, thank you so much, Eddie, for doing such a wonderful job moderating today's important discussion. And on behalf of the Hispanic Chamber, we want to extend a very special thank you to our participants today, Speaker Strauss, Dr. Francesco Soto, for sharing your insights on what we can expect, what our members can expect during this upcoming legislative session. We also do want to thank again our sponsors, Port San Antonio, our friends at Spectrum, Via Metropolitan Transit, CPS Energy for making today possible. We appreciate all the attendees today and everyone taking the time to join us. We hope that you found today's discussion informative and engaging. I know that I did, really enjoyed listening today. Our Hispanic Chamber has many exciting events planned for you this year, including a federal discussion of what to expect here in the coming months under a new presidential administration. So we look, we look forward to inviting you to attend and also keeping you informed on our advocacy efforts during the 87th Ledge. So until then, everyone stay safe and have a wonderful rest of your day. And thank you for being a part of today's discussion. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.